Well, hello everyone and welcome. My name is Sharon Bani. I'm the Executive Director for the Coalition on Adult Basic Education, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, which is Bridging the Skills Gap, Title I and Title II Working Collaboratively. We're just giving everybody a minute here to join. We have about 200 or so that will be joining us. And as you're joining, I just want to encourage everybody, why don't you put your name and the state you're joining from there in the chat box. Okay, so everybody that participates in this webinar will receive a certificate for CEU verification that will be delivered right to your inbox from our Zoom platform. So you can expect to receive that within 24 hours. As well, I just want to remind you all that the resources from this webinar and other webinars is located in our Adult Educators Repository. You can upload your own resources or download resources from other educators as well. Also, uh, we have some wonderful leadership opportunities coming up on the COA board. Regional Vice President and Regions 1, I'm sorry, Regions 2, 4, and 6 are open. So we'll be putting out information on that very shortly. Also, we have the COA National Awards coming up. Um, you're probably aware that we offer Teacher of the Year, Administrator of the Year, Adult Learner of the Year. They're $10,000 each. As well, we have a State Innovator Award, a Workplace of the Year Award, and a brand new Advocate of the Year Award. So what we're really trying to do is we're trying to increase participation at the grassroots level, which is why we've come up with this new Advocate of the Year Award. So be on the lookout for that. Also, we're so proud of the fact that working together as a field, we were able to stave off $87 million in funding cuts, and we're able to successfully add $35 million to the WIOA. So I wanted to remind you all that there is $25 million of additional funding that's available, and we need everybody to be contacting their legislators. If you go to educateandelevate.org, it's very easy to do so, and we can all work together to bring in that additional funding. As well, on our end, COABE is also reaching out to legislators we are also going to be meeting with Department of Ed folks as well. So we, on our end, we're really trying to make sure that that funding is there for you. Um, but you also can help by going to educateandelevate.org, clicking on the button there to contact your legislator. As well, we have our national conference coming up March 31st, April 3rd. That's going to be in New Orleans, Louisiana. We'll be sending out the mini grant application very shortly. Um, as you probably are aware, we give out 50 mini grants valued at $350 each. So please be on the lookout for that and we hope you'll be able to join us. We expect about 2,300 educators from around the country to join us for that event. And we'll be partnering with more than 35 organizations and we just wanted to give a quick rundown here of some of the strands you can expect at the conference. ABE, ESL, Immigrant Integration, Digital Literacy, Workforce, Health Literacy, CBO, CTE, Community College, WIOA Compliance, Numeracy, Financial Literacy, Disabilities, Leadership Advocacy and Awareness, Program Administration, Adult Learner, and so much more. So we have lots and lots of strands there for you, and we're really excited about that. And like I said, we partner with 35 national organizations to bring you the best professional development possible. As well, you're likely aware that we launched our journal. Um, this journal was published solely by COABE. It's a Career Pathways edition. And you can go to coabe.org backslash journal and pull up a copy for yourself. We've already had 11,000 downloads of this journal. This just went out three weeks ago. Very, very popular. It's because we have some excellent authors and writers who contributed. So I'd like to take a moment here to thank Judy Mortrud, who helped us coordinate this, as well as Johan Ubin, who wrote the leading article for us. So please, if you haven't done so yet, go to coweb.org and backslash journal to download your free copy today. So now it is my pleasure to introduce you to our sponsor, Burlington English. For those of you that don't know, Burlington English has been such a supporter of Coweb, and it really is the reason why we can provide these webinars to our members free of charge. So without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Miranda, who is filling in for Robert Breitbart from Burlington English. Miranda? 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, we're extremely privileged to be partnered with CoAbe, and we're so happy um, to be joining you all today. Uh, I am standing in for Robert, who sends his very best to everyone. Um, and hello to everyone who comes from my, my neck of the woods in California or over on the West Coast. Um, I'm, I am so excited this week. We're all very excited at Burlington uh, because we've just released um, our brand new career exploration and soft skills course. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there and let you know that um, it's out and ready to go for all levels of students. Uh, what we try and do for our students is create a curriculum that will introduce students to this concept of career pathways. Um, so that way they're able to uh, really understand and get a sense from the very beginning of being, uh, of coming into your programs and registering, kind of understanding what this process looks like, where they could head, what direction they could go. Um, so we introduce them to the 16 career clusters in this program, provide them with opportunities to learn about various jobs in all of these different career clusters. And we also expose them to career ladders so they can see kind of what opportunities they have as they, as they um, make their way through their specific career pathway. And this is an example of one of our job cards of a home health aide that kind of gives students some basic information about what those jobs look like. We also include career counseling videos to help students understand what the process looks like, what they're going to be exposed to, um, including relevant concepts and language. And then all of these courses include amazing practice with key soft skills in realistic workplace scenarios, which is really fun. Um, if you haven't ever seen Berlin, Burlington English before. Here's just a snapshot of all of the different career um, career courses that we offer and career word lists that we offer. And we even have this great mobile vocabulary practice. So your students can be working to improve their vocabulary for all of these various careers, no matter where they are, which is really amazing and fun. Um, so I'm standing in for Robert today, and I definitely want to put his information up here. If you have any questions or want to chat with us about what Burlington does, as far as supporting students as they get headed towards this career pathway, please let me know or please let Robert know, reach out to us. Um, and thank you so much for like letting us be on this morning. We're extremely, extremely excited to support CoAve and all of the great webinars that you do. So thank you so much, Sharon. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Miranda. I appreciate that. Um, and I would like to now take a moment here to share my screen one more time. Okay. Um, so yes, thank you so much Burlington English and without you this webinar would not be possible and we're very grateful for the products that you provide as well. So now I'd like to turn our attention to today's webinar presenters and now I'd just like to take a moment to introduce them. Um, first of all, I personally had the opportunity to view a webinar that they did for the state of Pennsylvania and it was so well done that I just thought, you know, this is the sort of thing that we want to really elevate and highlight at the national level. So I reached out to Jesse and Tim and asked them if they'd be willing to do the same sort of presentation for you all at the national level. So first, let me introduce them both. Um, Jesse McCree is the CEO of SCPA Works. It's the Regional Workforce Development Board whose mission is to unlock the human talent that drives the development of businesses and individuals, creating opportunity for growth and prosperity for the South Central PA region. Under Jesse's leadership, the organization invests over 14 million of public funds, annually supporting a labor force of over 740,000 people. The organization invests and evaluates and advances high impact workforce development programs, training centers, and policies that drive regional economic growth by connecting the needs of business and job seekers. Um, Jesse himself is currently enrolled in the Harvard Kennedy Schools of Executive Education Program for Nonprofit Leadership and he serves on numerous uh, boards of development. Tim Schenk is the Community Education Program Director for Lancaster Lebanon Intermediate in Unit 13, where he has worked for the past 22 years. Their mission is to educate and inspire lifelong learners, build partnerships, and unite communities to transform lives. The program provides HSC, ESL, and family literacy instruction, serves reentering citizens through a National Improved Reentry and Education Grant, coordinates after-school activities through 21st century funding, provides Title I employment and educational services to youth, 
facilitates a health careers academy in coordination with local post-secondary schools and operates a refugee center and community school for inner city middle school. Tim serves, or I'm sorry, Tim's staff of 50 serves over 2,000 learners annually. And I should also uh, mention that Tim is also in spare time, the president of the PACE, the Pennsylvania Association for Continuing Education, which has a mission of inspiring adult education partners through advocacy, networking, and professional development so that adults succeed and communities thrive. And I get the pleasure of working with Tim as he is one of our state association leaders. So without further ado, I'm going to stop speaking and turn this over to our wonderful presenters today. So Jesse and Tim. Sharon, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, hey, thanks to everyone to, uh, for, for joining us here this morning. Um, I'm going to pull up my screen here. Uh, my wife says that I have a, a face for radio. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say hi to everyone, and then I'm going to spare you uh, seeing my face the, the rest of the, the time here, and we'll, uh, we'll move right over to the slides. Um, thanks again for this opportunity to, uh, to be a part of this webinar. Um, and as Sharon said, um, you know, we, uh, we've been able to have this uh, presentation uh, in Pennsylvania, and I think what it, what it spoke to was a really unique collaboration uh, between Title I and Title II. And I think, and we'll, we'll look at this a little bit in the chat and the, the Q&A, uh, my suspicion is that this is happening uh, throughout other parts of, uh, of the country as well. So let me, um, let me minimize this here. And can everyone see uh, these uh, slides right here? It says the skills gap, why literacy and workforce development is everyone's business. Absolutely, yep, we can see right. that. Thanks so much, Sharon. So the two words in green, and it's what I wanna focus on just for a couple minutes. It's this term that we hear a lot about, the skills gap. We read about it in magazines and publications, uh, politicians all across the country. Uh, business leaders from workforce, economic development to educators are all talking about the skills gap. So what is the skills gap and, and why is that really an important context to this discussion that we're going to have today? Before we get into that, just a little bit of a context about what we do at South Central PA Works. And I think it's an important context for this discussion. Um, a lot of times people ask me, so what exactly does a workforce development board do? Uh, well, what we do is we act as a community convener and a community funder to invest in, evaluate, and advance high-impact workforce development programs for our region. We serve youth, young adults, adults, and even workers that have been uh, displaced or dislocated due to um, various economic impacts. So we are serving on a whole uh, sort of spectrum of workforce development uh, the training, the education, and the job placement services that really helps to drive our economy. And we're really serving two distinct but two very important customers. One is the job seeker, and the other is the employer. So a lot of times what we do at South Central PA Works is we really connect those employers and what their needs are specific to their business or their sector with the job seekers that are really looking to get back into the labor market. So it's what training do they need? What skills and credentials do they need? Where is their literacy level and how can we work with our Title II providers in our region to make sure that they get the up skills and the, the credentials that they need to compete? So as South Central PA Works as a Workforce Development Board, we're taking private and public dollars and working together as a community convener to fund the training and education programs that drives both the development of the job seeker, the individual, as well as the employer. So what we wanted to spend just a couple minutes talking about here uh, this afternoon is a little bit of the context of where this work happens in. Uh, back to the point about the skills gap is the context in Pennsylvania is a proxy for the context across the country in terms of how competitive the labor market is right now. I was just uh, looking at some data that came out a month ago and for the first time, this is really a remarkable statistic, uh, while the unemployment rate is not necessarily the best proxy for uh, everything that the, the health of the labor market, it is certainly an interesting point that for the first time in U.S. history, since uh, records have been kept, that there were more job openings in the U.S. than there were job seekers back in May. So for the first time ever, there were more jobs available than there were job seekers. This means that there really is a skills gap of those that are looking for work and the jobs that are there 
And really the work that both Title I and Title II is trying to do is bridge that skills gap by upskilling those folks that want to get back into the labor force to get those jobs that are available. So it's a really remarkable context that we're in across the country. Also wanted to talk just a minute about WIOA, or as we sometimes call it here in Pennsylvania, the INO, the Innovation and Opportunity Act, and how that has been a platform and a springboard for both Title I and Title II to work more collaboratively together. We want to talk a little bit about the why and the how of collaboration. Collaboration is a word that we use a lot uh, across both of our fields, but what does it really mean? And we're going to break down a little bit about what collaboration looked like locally here in South Central Pennsylvania and uh, sort of uh, hopefully being able to digest it to give you some actionable items about what we did here and some of the lessons learned about what that collaboration really looked like. I'm going to turn it over to Tim uh, in about 20 minutes or so to talk about the IET, the Integrated Education and Training Model, and how that sort of bubbled up here locally in South Central Pennsylvania as a really interesting and innovative model that we felt was a really um, useful way for Title I and Title II to get some funding and to pilot this model and to identify uh, what works and how we can continue to scale and sustain this IET model. So he'll talk a little bit about that. So, and, Tim and Sharon, you guys have seen this slide now a couple times as we've done this, but uh, I, I don't like to start off webinars or presentations with bad news, but I think that this is a very pointed and very indicative slide that for many across the country, and I know we have representation from all across the US today, that this slide right here really sums up in one slide a lot of the challenges that our communities are facing across the country. <clears throat> it's titled The Fading American Dream. Back in 1940, if you were born in 1940, the percentage of children that earned more than their parents for those born in 1940 was hovering around 91 or 92 percent. And that's part of this American dream, which is every generation is able to further their lives, the betterment of their families, they have access to education and economic opportunities. And so this 92 percent of children earning more than their parents represented, my children will do better than I will which is sort of a proxy for this quote unquote American dream. As you can see, this has declined what I would call precipitously since 1940. In fact, if you get to uh, my year, which is uh, 1983, although there is a little bit of a bump up there, um, we're about a coin flip. If you were born in the 80s, it's about a coin flip, 50-50 uh, chance that you're gonna earn more than your parents earn in your lifetime. This is all adjusted for inflation as well. So this is a really interesting slide, but I think as we look more into the data, we have two really distinct challenges in the US right now that separately would be significant barriers, but combined together, uh, it's, a, it's a particularly um, challenging set of barriers. And these two are, the first is what we call high income inequality. And many of us are very familiar with this, with the participants that we serve both in Title I and in Title II which is to say that there is a great inequality between those that have a high income and those that don't. So a very high income inequality in the US right now. That alone would be a challenge, but that when you combine that with this one, which is low socioeconomic mobility, this is a particularly challenging set of barriers when you combine the two. So not only do you have a high discrepancy between what we'll call the haves and the have nots, but we also have relatively low levels of those that are in the bottom quadrants of the socioeconomic ladder, there's low levels of being able to move up from, let's say, the bottom 20% of income to the top 20%. Very, very few make it from the bottom to the top. So you have this combination of high income inequality and low socioeconomic mobility, and this provides a, a set of very uh, tough challenges for our region. As we're all probably aware, the, the workforce composition in this country has also drastically changed. So we're dealing with a, a complex uh, challenge here, which is 40 years ago, jobs that required a high school diploma or less represented almost three quarters of the jobs that were out there just 40 years ago. The rest, about 28%, required some college or a college degree. Today, we've seen that the workforce demographics and the composition of today's workforce is drastically changed and it is changing dynamically even today, which is to say that 66, two thirds of the jobs that are out there require some college or college degree. Now, when we talk in just a minute, 
when we're talking about some college or college degree, a little bit more of a nuanced approach to this is going to be this post-secondary credential, right? So it could be a bachelor's degree, it could be an associate's degree, but it also may be something like an apprenticeship or some sort of industry recognized credential that's more than high school uh, and it could be less than a four-year degree. But that post-secondary credential is really essential for competing in today's labor market. In addition, we've also seen that there is a growing wage disparity and it's sort of hollowing out uh, this quote unquote middle class. Um, in 1979, those with a high school diploma made about 25% less. Um, and now fast forward 2012, the most recent data that we have on this is those with a high school diploma make 50% less than those with a bachelor's degree. So as you can see, the ability to compete in the labor market is directly correlated to the skills, the knowledge, the training, the education, and the credential that one receives. So let's go back big picture here just for a second. And we talked about the unemployment rate a few minutes ago. This is Pennsylvania right now in terms of the unemployment rate. And again, as many of you know, the unemployment rate is not necessarily the, the best or only proxy for the health of the labor market, but I think it's relevant to show that in some pockets of Pennsylvania where we are in South Central, uh, this area right here is less than 4% in many cases. And in some pockets of Pennsylvania, we're seeing 3.4%, 3.3%. So historically, these are very, very low numbers for unemployment. Certainly not all across the state are they seeing those levels. But what we're seeing here, back to the point about there are more job openings than there are job seekers, uh, those that are officially unemployed, is that this is all the context of the skills gap. We have high levels of income inequality, low levels of socioeconomic mobility. We have an increasing wage disparity for those that have just a high school diploma and those that have a bachelor's degree. And in addition, in many counties uh, across our region, there are more job openings than there are job seekers. So really the question is, how do we get the people that are in our communities, the skills, the knowledge, the training, the ability to take those jobs and be successful in those jobs that are growing, that are in high demand. This is a really interesting slide here. Again, this is just a little bit of the context of what we're working in here in South Central Pennsylvania. And I'm sure many throughout the country are seeing similar trends as well. This is just a little snapshot of the occupational gaps that we see here in South Central Pennsylvania. Over in the top right-hand corner, we see that over the next 10 years in Pennsylvania, the average annual occupational gaps for things such as health, healthcare practitioners and technical occupations is 4,200 a year. That is to say there are 4,200 more jobs than there are qualified job seekers for a healthcare practitioner, which would be a registered nurse would be an example of that. So every year, that gap gets wider by 4,200 jobs in Pennsylvania. So if we could get 4,200 nurses to come in and we could place them in Pennsylvania in the right spots, in the right places, we would be able to fill all of those jobs with those 4,200 nurses every single year for the next 10 years. Management occupations, construction and extraction occupations, computer, mathematical, STEM occupations, those are all growing and there is a significant occupational gap in Pennsylvania. Down at the lower part under uh, the, uh, in, in the uh, circled in yellow, we see the occupations that have a surplus, which is to say that there are more workers in these occupations than there are jobs. Sales, food prep, office and admin, production occupations, those are all areas where there are more uh, job seekers. There are more that are employed than there are jobs available. So really, one of the things that's interesting about this Title I and Title II working collaboratively together is we're probably serving, and data is showing that we're serving, in many cases, a very similar population. So how do we get those that are in the, the lower left-hand quadrant in the personal care, production, office, and admin occupations and move them up into, through the right training, the right education, the right programs, these uh, occupations in the top right-hand corner, circled in red, that are in demand, that are uh, high priority occupations, and that are growing. So it's really being able to bridge this skills gap between those occupations that have a deficit and those that have a surplus. 
this is another interesting slide too, where we talk about these middle skilled jobs, and this will come up a little bit when Tim talks about the integrated education and training model or the IET model, because what we're not talking about is that all of people, you know, that everyone needs to go get a four year degree or that everyone needs to be in management occupations. Uh, what we're really talking about is that there are these middle skilled jobs, jobs that require more than a high school diploma, but less than a four year degree. And those jobs represent a majority of the jobs in Pennsylvania. In fact, the middle skill jobs currently, 2015, the data is a couple years old, but it hasn't changed that much. It's about 54 or 55% of all jobs are what we call middle skill jobs. As you see, there is a dearth, there is a lack of middle skill workers. So what are the programs, what are the educational services that we can provide for those that may be in low skill jobs uh, and be able to bring them up to that middle skill work level. Uh, and again, that's less than a four year degree. It could be some sort of post-secondary credential, it could be an apprenticeship program, it could be anything that is more than a high school diploma, less than a four year degree, to have them compete for these jobs that are out there, that are growing, and that pay uh, a, a pretty solid wage in many cases. So really this, this gap, is concentrated not in the high or low skill jobs, but in these middle skill jobs. Again, what we just talked about by 2020, and this is across the country, about two thirds of all jobs will require at least some post-secondary education, which again, this is the context for why in Title I, it's so important for us to be working with our adult education providers um, and our organizations uh, such as literacy councils in our region that are really helping people to uh, bolster their, um, their literacy levels as well as positioning them to start to go after these post-secondary credentials. A little bit more context here before we shift gears into, so how do we work more collaboratively together? In Pennsylvania, um, we see that uh, the percentage of employment by training um, required for jobs today is again, matching up with what we've just seen. About two thirds to three quarters of jobs require less than a postgraduate degree or a bachelor's degree. So again, this is achievable um, for uh, folks that are currently not in the labor market to get those post-secondary credentials and compete in the labor market. In Pennsylvania, 13% of adults in this commonwealth lack even basic literacy skills. This is a, a staggering number when you think about the impact it has in our communities. And on average, adults that are at the lowest levels of literacy are almost 10 times more likely to be living below the poverty line. So there is a direct benefit to the individual, to the business that would be hiring that individual, and to the greater regional economy to improve literacy skills uh, and, and basic literacy competencies to help that individual compete in the labor market. So again, this is the context for why would Title I and Title II feel it valuable to be working together? Well, we're working with a very similar population, and the big question in our region here, as I know it is across the country, is this is the question that keeps me up at night. Are we going to have the skilled workforce to keep up with our future growth, with the changing industry needs, and uh, shifting demographics? So let's switch gears a little bit here. The opportunity in front of us here in South Central Pennsylvania, I believe, is an opportunity across the country as well. Uh, there is a great importance, and, and might I even say necessity, of having workforce development and education working not only in alignment, but really working in lockstep to help solve these challenges. We all know there are plenty of organizations in our regions across the country that are doing great work, but a lot of times we find ourselves working in silos or working not understanding that another organization right down the road is serving a very similar population and that we would do ourselves and that individual service by working more in alignment together. Employers need a skilled workforce. They, every time I talk to a business in this region, their number one concern is, do we have the skilled workforce and where can we identify the skilled workforce? And in addition, adult learners need support uh, in obtaining these in-demand skills for these high priority occupations and these credentials that will help them be successful. So this is really a win-win-win for our organizations, for the individuals, and for the businesses in our region. Okay, plenty of context there. I think you get the point. Uh, this is important work to be doing together and these are uh, major challenges that are happening across our country. So let's shift gears and talk a little bit about collaboration. So we talk about collaboration. 
Um, and it's a word that we toss around a lot for sure. But what exactly does that mean? Um, here in our organization, we talk about a couple different ways that we can approach collaboration. Uh, one is compliance, right? And so for WIOA, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, both Title I and Title II are more closely tied together, both in the law as well as in many of our state plans, both Title I and Title II services are much more integrated. In addition, as we'll talk about in a minute, the performance outcomes and the measures for Title I and Title II are the same. So there is a reason to collaborate, and that is, well, we owe it tells us to. Um, I think that there is a more compelling reason to work together in collaboration, and that's more of a strategic approach. So as we've just talked about, uh, WIOA implementation does present an opportunity for us. Number one, performance, we have shared common measures. And so there's certainly an opportunity for us to talk to, on the Title I side, our Title II partners and say, we're being measured by the, the same common measures. We should figure out some ways that we can help each other out, collect better data about the populations that we're serving, and really help both of our separate organizations achieve these uh, common measures. But I think more importantly, when we take a uh, human-centered design approach or a customer-centered design approach, working together is really for the betterment of the individual. It's for the betterment of the people that we serve. Uh, stronger referral networks, better data sharing, improved customer service. These are all the benefits of the workforce side and the education side saying, hey, instead of us working in silo, there's opportunities for us to streamline, increase referrals, share data, and measure impact in a better way, which will ultimately help the person that we're serving. I also put on there opportunities, and Tim and I will talk a little bit about some, some funding opportunities that we received in Pennsylvania uh, to help spur this work on. Real quick, I just alluded to this, what gets measured gets done, right? So under WIOA, we have these aligned performance measures, and this really was the basis for a conversation in South Central PA about how Title I and Title II can work more closely together. I think also on this slide too, as we're talking about collaboration, one of the things that emerged when uh, our workforce and adult education providers came together was we saw that there was really a need to develop a common language between the Title I and Title II providers. That is to say, many times we were talking about the same thing, but we were using two very distinct set of terminologies to describe that. So I think that there was a really interesting operationally, a really interesting opportunity for us to say, what we're talking about is the same thing. Let's share, a, uh, let's develop a common language that we can better sort of navigate the different requirements and, and parameters of each of our different programs so that we can better serve the individual. Again, collaboration across our two systems today uh, really positioned us for some funding opportunities uh, at the state level uh, that really set the tone for this work. So I'm going to hand it over to Tim here in, in just a minute. Um, and Tim's going to talk a little bit about how Title I and Title II really locally uh, began to work together uh, for us to identify, hey, how can we better work together and take collaboration from more of a, hey, we owe it tells us to, to there's a real great opportunity for us to better serve uh, our population in South Central PA. So Tim, do you want to take it from here? Sure. Uh, thanks so much, Jesse. And as an adult education director in the South Central region, I, I feel so uh, privileged to be able to work with Jesse as our, as our Workforce Development Board Executive Director. Um, I know not everyone has, uh, you know, Workforce Development Board partners um, that are, you know, as easy to work with as Jesse. So we're really, really thankful for that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn off my video as well here and um, share my screen. Um, so Jesse, if you can stop sharing your screen, or actually I'm able to turn you off so I can turn mine on. Okay, great. All right. So should be all set there. Um, and also just uh, for those of you who have questions as we're talking, um, you can write them into the Q&A box at the bottom, and uh, then we will get to those uh, at the end of the presentation. But um, in Title I and, and Title II, we decided to have a summit um, of adult educators um, as well as uh, the, the case managers that, are, that were working in the um, in the field. Um, I was going to turn this off. Hold on one second. All 
All right, I will, I will do that later on, not cooperating. Um, and so we did a Zoom presentation and um, what we did was uh, we uh, ha had a, um, a presentation between Title I and Title II where we presented uh, information um, about uh, you know, what, what, what the different services that we are doing in the, in the various regions. And we highlighted success. So what we did was um, we showed um, areas in which uh, Title I and Title II were working together effectively. Um, and then after that Zoom presentation, then we had county meetings to take some of those best practices and move them into a county specific uh, type of operation. Um, and each county was given time to really figure out, you know, what, what works for them. And then we came together um, as Title I and Title II partners and we had show and tell presentations by county. And in doing that, we were able to share best practices with each other. And we even had like a shark tank type of thing where, uh, you know, Jesse, Jesse and his team decided on which uh, counties got the best, had the best presentations and had the best ideas. Um, and there was an award of, of having lunch with Jesse as a result of uh, the counties that won that. So we made it fun and it really provided an opportunity for those who are on the ground working um, to collaborate with each other. Um, so what we learned uh, through that whole exercise of the summit was just, you know, the need for more communication, um, the importance of better data sharing uh, with each other, opportunities for potential funding collaboration was something that came up, um, and just new ways that we could work together under WIOA. So one of the biggest outcomes, um, at least for us here at the IE13 Community Education, was a determination to uh, pilot an integrated education and training model. And we did that through funding support from the South Central Workforce Development Board. And what I'd like to do before I go too far into the IET is just to find out how much you as participants know about um, IET. So I'll stop sharing my screen. So Sharon, you can go ahead and run that poll. If everyone could respond to the poll, that would be great. Sharon, will the results be coming up on the screen? Can you can you see that? It's going right now. I can see um, so far we've had 98 of 139 people have voted. Can you see that? I cannot. You cannot. Hmm. Well, I, here, I just ended the polling. Can you see that? Where I'm sharing the results? Yep, I can see it. Great. Okay, so it's a real mix. That's helpful to know as I move into it. It looks like 25% actually have actually implemented the model, so they would be very knowledgeable about it. Um, and then 30% have not, you, or are not familiar with it at all. So that's great, thank you. So uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the IET model, um, it combines um, adult education and literacy with workforce preparation and workforce training. Um, and so when I'm talking about uh, workforce, well, adult education could be you know, English language services, it could be GED, high school equivalency. Um, workforce uh, preparation is really, you know, kind of some of some of those soft skills, making sure you show up at work on time, 
um, that you treat your supervisor um, in a respectful manner. And then workforce training is a certification type of training that would go with it. And in the IET model, all of those components are supposed to be of sufficient intensity and quality, occur simultaneously. They should be organized uh, to function cooperatively um, with a single set of learning outcomes. Um, so by doing the IET model, it really expedites the process of language learners and those who need math and reading training uh, to get the certification um, all, you know, all at the same time, and, and it, it speeds it up so that rather than going through a whole course of study with um, high school equivalency and then moving into certification, they can do both at the same time. Um, it's a national model, uh, started, as far as I know, in Washington State many years ago, over a decade ago. Um, so in talking with uh, Jesse um, about the IET model, um, you know, Jesse understands the need to have adult education and post-secondary working together and having Title I and Title II working together. And um, he said, hey, there's, there's um, an innovation grant that we can write. Um, so we worked on that grant uh, together and um, we're able to access $300,000 for a two-county region for Lancaster and Lebanon counties. And uh, the partners were my program, IE13 Community Education as well as the Literacy Council of Lancaster, Lebanon. They are our sister organization. Um, Harrisburg Area Community College and Community uh, Technology Training Centers um, in Lancaster and Lebanon County, as well as, as well as some other providers. And the trainings that we focused on were the uh, National Institute for Medical Assistant Advancement, NEMA. Um, this was a training for individuals, many of whom were doctors, in their home countries, um, but were not able to enter the medical field in the United States because of language barriers. Um, this, this was a very intensive uh, program for just a few individuals, four or five of them, um, and it was, it was highly successful for those individuals, but it was also, it was intensive. It was about nine months of training. And then we had a lot of really short-term trainings like administrative support, CNA, um, food service, hospitality, physician, office assistant that were just a, you know, a couple of weeks or a few weeks um, of time. And I'm going to show some data um, to you that we got from the training. Um, so you can see here the different trainings, administrative support, CNA that I just mentioned, and how many people were in each of those trainings. So by far the most people, 34, went through the CNA. Um, as I said, the NEMA was a small group. It was five individuals. 86% um, of those who started the trainings completed them. And I'm going to focus on some, uh, you know, I'm gonna look at CNA and I'm gonna look at NEMA. Those are two particular trainings that we, we spent a lot of time on. Uh, so if I click on CNA here, you can see that 29 completed the class and five did not. So fairly good, fairly good rate there for completion rates. Um, if you look at uh, the number that were employed before the class, it was 16. Um, when the class was finished, it was 23. And here it says employment status 60 days after is 11, but that's because the data is not complete yet and it, the, the classes have just ended. So we don't know how many will maintain employment 60 days after. Um, but these numbers were different by class because we ran the CNA program in Lancaster and in Lebanon, and the Lebanon program was, um, had almost a 100% success rate of graduation and individuals who were not employed prior to class getting employment afterwards. And I think you know, part of that is you know, it really has to do with the partners. Um, it has to do with the teachers involved. Um, there are just so many other variables that you know, can make it either more or less successful. Uh, the NEMA is another one that I wanted to focus on. Five individuals, um, they all passed the class, all five of them passed the class, um, and none of them were employed before the class, and all of them had employment afterwards. So just really thrilled um, with, with those numbers. So some classes were very successful, some not so successful, um, but what it taught us, um, and I'll go back to this slide here, um, is what it taught us is just that um, it's, it's, it's so helpful to have some uh, funding available. I mean, $300,000 is a nice, nice chunk of change, 
um, that we could really pilot some new and innovative ideas. Um, and Jesse was able to provide us with a great amount of flexibility in what we did and who we served. So we weren't tied to some of the regulations that you know we're used to through Title I or Title II. Um, it was very flexible funding. And it would also was it also made it possible for us to bring the post-secondary partners to the table because we were able to pay them for their time. We were able to pay student tuition. Um, we were able to do so much with that money. And as a result, um, we are seeing sustainability. So that the pilot is actually done, the $300,000 finished uh, June 30th. Um, but now we are seeing United Way money coming in. We're seeing some additional Title I youth money coming in to support the initiative. Um, others are writing us into their grants because they like the IET model so much. Um, so it's just a real you know, learning exercise that, wow, when you have that kind of flexibility and funding, and try some new things and develop those partnerships, it can, it can really pay off in terms of developing sustainability. Um, Jesse, I'm gonna, why don't you and I both, get both a tag team on this? This is actually the last slide of our presentation, but just some takeaways if you wanna kind of speak up here and talk about um, some ideas on this slide. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Tim. And uh, I, Tim, you're bringing up a lot of really good points and I do see a question that's popped up in the Q&A uh, so before we get to uh, Patrick Brown, your, your question, um, certainly want to open it up to anyone else who wants to ask a couple questions uh, that Tim and I can tackle here. So yeah, I mean, a couple of the big takeaways um, that, that we've kind of talked about a little bit is the context here in Pennsylvania, which I know is similar across the country, is the challenge is finding skilled workers. People are out there that, that want to work, that are working, uh, Title I and Title II working together is uh, really putting the, the opportunity on the table to develop a skilled pipeline of workers and working more collaboratively together is going to really sort of tackle this skills gap, which is, which is key. As, as Tim alluded to this, the, the education, uh, adult education and workforce partners have uh, in this region, I know have had a, a long uh, partnership, but I, I really feel like going from meeting quarterly, uh, which has been great, and discussing trends, which is great, uh, to moving more to uh, running programs together, uh, aligning our services together. Um, really, that to me is the, uh, is, the, is the part of this that's most exciting. Uh, we have a lot of stakeholders in workforce development, and Tim, I know at the, at the IU, you guys have a lot of folks and, and stakeholders that you're working with that we know about, but alignment and integration of services is really why this IET model was so exciting because it really put both of us at the table and said, let's run a program together for the betterment of adult learners. Um, and Tim, you alluded to this before, um, you know, partnering with your workforce board. I know that there are, boy, I've, I used to know the exact number. I think it's north of 500 workforce boards across the country. Um, so they are, um, they're out there and they're in your region. Um, I'm sure many of you are already working with your workforce boards. Um, the, my encouragement would be continue to do that and continue to be involved, join committees, join the board and approach your board and say, what funding opportunities can we work on uh, together? So that, just a, a couple, couple points there that I think are, are really critical, Tim. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I'll reiterate just the whole importance of, of collaboration and relationship development. Um, I've been on the South Central Workforce Development Board for over 10 years. Um, we have an adult education coalition that, that meets quarterly, and we meet with uh, Jesse and his staff uh, during those quarterly meetings. So it's a Title I, Title II quarterly meeting that we have together. Um, but that relationship took time to, to develop, um, and it takes time to develop that type of, of trust in each other and to know that uh, we really need each other in order to be successful. So, so I there yeah, so there, there are a couple, couple questions, um, and I, I want to be mindful of, of the time that we've got and, and if other questions come through. Tim, do you, wanna, uh, you and I want to tackle a couple of these here and see if it prompts some other, some other conversation as well? Yeah, I see one question that's on my screen right now. Do you see others as well? Uh, there's a couple in the chat box as well. Let's tackle oh, the okay. Q&A one first, and then we'll, we'll go through some of the ones. Okay. The great information. I wonder if I ask how long this process took and what your meetings look like today. Do you have regular meetings with the IET participating programs to capture data outcomes, share professional development, attract students? Um, so yeah, I will say that what happened as a result of the IET 
process um, is that certain relationships really took off and certain relationships did not. So there were some partners that we were sure, post-secondary partners that we were sure were going to come to the table because we were, they were interested in it before there was even any money available. Um, and they never really took us up on it. Um, whereas other partners that we thought you know, probably wouldn't work out very well, they, they stepped up and they provided a great partnership. So with um, the community college, we are continuing um, to run IET models with them in both, in both counties. Um, we are continuing to run the IET model with some of our partners at CareerLink through um, the, the Title I provider is called EDSI in our region. And uh, we are working hand-in-hand uh, -hand with them to continue the IET model at our local CareerLink. Um, and then there's also a community services group out in the community that uh, provides mental health support for individuals. And we're working with them to develop um, an IET model with some, some additional United Way funding. So yes, we the, the data that I showed on my screen um, very briefly earlier um, is the beginning data that you know it, it's the end of the year data that we're looking at. But uh, what we want to do is take that out into the community and really show folks how beneficial the IET program is. That's great. So there's another question. Um, the question from the on the chat box is: Do your strategies support the working poor to enable them to participate in both Title One and Title Two? Um, I think this is a great question, actually, and it's something that we've alluded to a little bit, um, but my, my conversations and, and my talking points have been mostly focused on those that are unemployed. And uh, for Carol, who asked this question, you're exactly right. I, when, I, when I speak about those that are unemployed, um, I really probably a, a better word for that is underemployed, right, which would include the working poor. Um, Tim, I don't know if you have these numbers um, right at your fingertips about how many of the IET participants that we collected data on were currently working. Um, but I think what, what's important to remember about this is uh, not everyone that we're serving is currently officially unemployed, but in fact is working, they're working poor or they're underemployed. And I think it's really helping to move those individuals from a place where they are uh, working at maybe a, a lower wage, lower skill job giving them the, the credentials, the contextualized learning um, in this IET model, for example, and really being able to upskill them and bring them up along the economic opportunities pathway. So many of uh, the folks that we're serving uh, are probably the, the working poor. Tim, do you, do you have any numbers about those that were actively working at the beginning of the program? Yeah, so on my screen, you'll see that 19 of the participants actually were working before they started the certification program and then 36 uh, got employment immediately thereafter. Hmm. Uh, 36 were employed immediately thereafter. So many of them are the working poor, and the idea is really to um, get them on a new career pathway. You know, once they get a certification, I mean, like certific CNA is a very low level paying job, um, but that's not the end of the road. I mean, the idea is to get them in with an employer who will pay for their continuing education after they get their CNA so they can climb that career ladder. Um, so yeah, I would say that we were working with many of the working poor uh, through the IET model. You know, an interesting follow-up to that is it's in some cases a little bit more challenging to identify and recruit folks for a program like this that are working. And I think a lot of it is because of work schedules, family, uh, you know, uh, responsibilities, things that things that happen that may be outside of the the nine to five, um, you know, sort of your time at work. And so how does one actively recruit a person who is working, uh, you know, first or second or third shift for a program like this? And there's another question in, in the chat box about, are your learners at an adult ed site, a work site, or working from home using mobile learning? And in this question, and I don't think that we at the Workforce Board have fully gotten our arms around this question, but I think the answer is it could and should be all of the above, right? I mean, I know employers have approached uh, us and, and Tim, I think as well as is, is with you, or at least others on the Title II side about setting up a, a site at the place of employment, right, at their business for an ESL class or a literacy class. Uh, certainly, it could be at an adult education site. It could be at an um, American job center, which we call them PA Career Links here in Pennsylvania. Um, but I think there's also an opportunity for us to incorporate this IET model using hybrid learning models, right? So a little bit of classroom, a little bit of online or distance learning. So I think it's, it's 
all of the above um, are potentials, and we, we're still trying to figure out, you know, what's the what's the right mix of uh, of locations and vehicles to deliver this, uh, particularly for those that are are working, right? So if you're if you're working first shift, and then you've got a family, maybe the the only opportunity you have is to do uh, an online class uh, after the kids have gone to bed, right? So we've got to be flexible, and we've got to utilize a lot of the technologies that are out there today to to better give access to to all uh, individuals that. That could benefit from these programs. Yeah. So, so on my screen, I have just another chart that shows the number that were employed prior: thirteen percent for the physician office assistant, and then fifty percent when the class was finished. In NEMA, no one was employed prior, and one hundred percent were employed afterwards. Hospitality, no one was employed prior. Fourteen percent afterwards. Um, I believe that was a TANF group that was, um, and then CNA, sixty-four percent up to eighty-eight percent. Administrative support, thirteen to fourteen percent. Um, but the other point I wanted to make when you were talking about technology is that uh, food service, hospitality, um, those two, and also administrative support, those were actually all online modules. So what we did was we worked with the CareerLink and they had something called metrics where um, if folks were able to work online to develop certifications in certain areas, but there was no teacher involved. So what we did was to actually use the IET model to be able to bring in an adult ed instructor to help them uh, to navigate the course, but then also to develop their language, their language reading and math skills um, in order to be successful. And then NEMA was done, this one was done for the medical assistants um, through actual distance education where the instructor was in another part of the, of the state. Um, the post-secondary instructor was in another part of the state, and so they would meet online and then our adult ed instructor would be in the room with them. Um, the CNA was more the typical IET model where we had the adult educator and the post-secondary instructor in the same classroom together teaching simultaneously. Are there any other questions? There are no more questions in the chat box, Jesse. I'm so sorry, I actually had myself on mute by accident. So um, if you're sitting in an office in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania on mute on a webinar and no one hears you, did you ever actually even ask the question? So uh, <laughs> um, Julie's question, do you co-enroll learners in both Title I and Title II? This is another great question too. Um, this was, the short answer is for this specific grant, because it was more flexible funding, there was, we did not put the requirement on that a person had to be eligible for both Title I and or Title II. But if we look at what this grant money taught us, and what this pilot project taught us, is that I think the short answer is yes, we would, we would definitely want to co-enroll learners in both Title I and Title II for a program like this. So for instance, if I have my WIOA allocation for the year and I'm working with Tim and Tim's got some Title II funds, then we need to set up a system or a better data sharing method by which when they walk into our American Job Center, our PA career link, and they register for Title I and we enroll them, we're asking the right questions or we're then making the referral over to Title II to say, hey, wouldn't it be interesting if they also, if we could also co-enroll them in, in Title II and then be able to align the funding in the appropriate way. Uh, there's a word I love to use called fungibility, and it's, it's we put the fund back in fungibility for our dollars. Uh, it's you know using the funds where they're most appropriate so that you can free up other funds and and use it to do some other things. And that's the benefit of co-enrolling learners in both Title One and Title Two. So the short answer is for this specific program, we didn't because we wanted to make the dollars as flexible as possible. But moving forward, I think Tim, what what I've learned is that. The more we can co-enroll, the more flexible and, and more fungible we can use these dollars. Absolutely. And there is one more question on the Q&A, and I think it's more of a question for Sharon. It says, how can we reaccess the materials used in this webinar? Oh, yes. I'm happy to answer that question. So at the start of this webinar, I had mentioned that we have an adult educators repository. There are lots and lots of resources, including the resources that were shared here. So all COAVE members can access that. That's free of charge due to your membership. You'll want to go to coave.org and click on professional development and you'll see the link there to be able to go into the adult educators repository and download the, the resources there. Very good. 
So gentlemen, I just would like to thank you both. You did a fantastic job. We really, really appreciate your time and expertise on this topic. And uh, I know I can speak for all of our guests here that this has been just a wonderful presentation. And so without further ado, I'd like to turn this back to Miranda to see if she has anything that she'd like to add as we close up here. Yeah, thank you so much, Sharon. Um, I also want to say thanks so much, Tim and Jesse. You guys are doing some absolutely amazing work up in Pennsylvania. Um, Burlington is very, very happy to be a part of this and, and to be supporting CoAve as they have this great, great medium for getting, you know, these types of projects out in front of adult educators across the U.S. So just wanted to say thank you so much. We're very, very happy to be a part of it. And if there's anything that Burlington English can do to help support your learners when it comes to providing software curriculum, do not hesitate at all to reach out to us um, at burlingtonenglish.com. And you can reach out to Miranda or or to Robert Breitbart. Thanks so much. Wonderful. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you, Jesse and Tim. And we'll see everybody else on the next webinar. With that, we say goodbye from Coe.